It's, um, it's really good to live long enough to get old enough that something in your life can be described as you're historically known for doing something. Um, thank you for uh, putting up with me for a few minutes. Um, I also want to thank Jim and the, the, uh, the conference and the organizers for inviting me to speak. I spoke at one of their other conferences at, uh, in Lake Tahoe last, uh, last winter, and um, it was a, an amazing event. Um, my son, this is a picture of my son who came with me and met Linus, and um, I think it's a, a moment he'll remember for all his life. We actually hung out with Linus for a little bit and um, listened to his talk, and my, my son has just turned 12. I think it was um, an amazing experience, and, and people were so nice to both of us. Um, Linus was so nice. Aparna, who was just talking, uh, hung out with us for a bit. And my son, I think, was very inspired to meet people who are really doing things like that. Um, I also really think that, that you guys, the open source community, are, are the good guys of, of the tech industry, you know, the ones who build things, who build most of what we use uh, today. I, um, I want to start with sort of an apology or a mea culpa or a fall on the sword moment, whereas some people might remember, a long time ago, I was a journalist at Forbes, and I covered open source, and I covered IBM, and I was um, famously somewhat skeptical about open source and about Linux, and here we are in 2017. So I, uh, my skepticism was misplaced. Um, I also, on the Fake Steve blog, I used to kind of have fun with the sort of more radical elements of, of the movement, and particularly Stallman. This is one where he's killing a shark that violated the GPL. But... Um, I, I just thought he was kind of too extreme, too radical, that his ideas were maybe even good, but they, would, they were impractical. The funny thing is, as I've got older, I've kind of become radicalized, um, which isn't supposed to happen. You're supposed to go the other way and become, I guess, more conservative. Anyway, uh, that didn't happen for me. Um, so I'll get to what I'm going to talk about, and it's a very quick story. Um, uh, and the full version is in this book that I published last year, and if you're interested in it, um, you can get it and read it. Uh, but I'm just going to give you a nutshell of it today, which is that I went to work in a startup thinking that I knew a lot about the tech industry and um, came away realizing that a lot of what I thought I knew was wrong and that the industry had changed in some profound ways and in ways that I think uh, have gone off the rail a bit. and, and could end up affecting all of us, you know, becoming a problem for us. So I got laid off at Newsweek. I was the tech editor at Newsweek. I got laid off, and I went to work at this startup in Cambridge. I live in Boston. And it's a place called HubSpot, which some of you might use at your company. They make marketing software for you know, marketing automation. And the weird thing was the average age at the company was 26, and I was 52. I was exactly twice double the age of the average employee. And most people were right out of college. Um, and they had every startup cliche you can imagine, as if there's like a catalog for goofy startup stuff, and they just said, it will take one of those, two of those, one of those. So we had the dogs in the office. We had beanbag chair meeting rooms. Uh, we had all the, you know, the open offices. Nobody has a, an office. You're all at these big tables. We had these big, bright, basic colors. As you can tell on the slide, uh, orange was the corporate color, so we had orange everything. Um, we had these sales bro guys, these like former lacrosse players who did a push-up club in the lobby every day, like where they would be like, bro, you know, join in, you know, and um, do you even lift? And, um, and then we had beer, like beer everywhere, like refrigerators full of beer, and the bros would like after the push-up club go down in their flip-flops and the backward baseball caps and get some beer, go back to the desk, make their calls for the afternoon. And then we had a nap room with a big hammock and a nice little Hawaiian theme. You could go in there and sleep off, uh, you know, the buzz from the beer. Anyway, so it was like I had never worked in a place like this, right? And I kind of always wanted to, but, but it was like a frat house mixed with a Montessori kindergarten and a Scientology compound, right? It was like you put those three things in one room, right? And along the lines of the Scientology thing, that's actually the scariest and coolest part of this because it was really culty in a way that I had never experienced before. So when you joined, the first thing you had to do was go through two weeks of training, and ostensibly it was to learn how to use the software. But really it was a kind of brainwashing. Really it was like indoctrination. You're really being told 
what it took to be a member of the cult, right? And everyone, we we're all rock stars. I don't know why, we're all rock stars now. And we had superpowers. And it was like, you know, the, you, you've been accepted into the X-Men Academy, right? Like they would tell us, it's harder to get a job here than it is to get into Harvard, right? And I'm sitting there going like, this is bullshit, right? Like I'm, a, I'm the one old guy in the room, right? And that, the other kids, the kids are like, okay, harder than Harvard, right? Okay, you know, they're all first job, right? And um, we had to go around and talk about ourselves and you know, introduce ourselves and tell us what's the one thing that makes you a special snowflake? What's something that nobody here knows about you or, or makes you special? Like, and, the, and the leader's like, I'll tell you my thing is I play in a heavy metal band on the weekends, right? I'm like, okay, great. I got nothing and I hate this shit, right? Like every, you know, who, I hate the one that come around, talk about yourself. And I'm like, I'm the only one in the room who's had a colonoscopy, right? You know, and they're like, <laughs> uh, happy to describe it, kids, because it's coming your way, you know? You know? Hang in there. There's a hose. <laughs> um, <laughs> seriously, yeah. Um, for those of you who haven't turned 50 yet, God, you have, you have something to live for now. Um, so we had a, a, a culture code. The founder of the company, one of the founders, had created this long thing, the culture code, and the subtitle was creating a company we love, right? And we're supposed to love the company. And as far as I could tell, for a long time, I didn't even know what my job was, but I did know the way to succeed was just to love the company, just be super enthusiastic like these guys. Wear orange to work, jump up. If, you, if the picture being taken, jump for the picture, right? Um, be super positive. There was a woman who would end her emails and sign off like, go HubSpot, go, with a bunch of exclamation points, because I love exclamation points, right? They're marketing people, right? Um, if any of you work in marketing, you know what I mean. Um, and they had this thing that I came to call a praisegasm, where they found out, you could figure out pretty quickly that the way you got rewarded was also by how much you praised other people, right? Which is a kind of a, a, a cool idea, right? You, so, because you get people sending praise to everybody, right? So the really people who really wanted to get attention for themselves, it wasn't about bragging about yourself. What you did was just find anything to praise in anyone else. And so Julie would decide that Ashley was, um, did a great job last week. And she wanted to say, Ashley rocks. But the way you do that is you don't, in any place I work, what you do is you send Ashley a note saying, hey, by the way, last week that thing you did, that was awesome, right? And if you really wanted to you know, help her out, you'd CC her boss and just say, this one, great, right? But at HubSpot, what you did is you CC your, the whole department. So you'd come in in the morning and there'd be this thing where somebody had written a love note to someone else, right? Okay, great, cool, I don't care. I don't know either of you, fine, fuck off, right? So, um, but. <laughs> Then the protocol was everyone on the email would reply to all to say, you know, yeah, I agree. You kick ass, man. Like, you're the best. You're a rock star, right? And, uh, and so your email would just fill up. And I'm sitting there like I'm old and I'm a prick anyway. And I'm just like, fuck it, delete, 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 fuck, 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 right? So, and then I decided, no, then I look like a curmudgeon, right? And I got to make this work. So I start joining in, but on things like, yeah, woo-hoo, Ashley. And then I put like a thousand exclamation points, like, woo -hoo! And then they figured out, you know, you're being a dick. Stop that, right? So, <laughs> so it really, very quickly went off the rails, this job. Um, they were so super positive that when they fired you, they called it graduation, right? <laughs> Seriously. And they would send around this really cheery email saying, hey, gang, just want, hey, no, hey, team. We just want everyone to know that uh, Derek has graduated and we can't wait to see what he's gonna do with his superpowers and his next big rock star adventure and we wish him the best. And I was like, dude, you just fired that guy, right? And you look over and the desk is empty. He's already gone. Like there was no warning, just boom, he's gone. Like it was like living in Argentina in the 1970s. Just people disappear, Ooh, I don't even know why, right? And they're never spoken of again. Nobody would ever gossip about it, ever, right? They were like Spinal Tap drummers, just a little, poof, like, a little pile of dust left on the chair. And um, I never saw anything like this. And, and you know, people would be out in their cars crying because they, they graduated a lot of people, even though we were growing. Graduation happened all the time, right? And nobody there thought it was a problem. This is the twist for me. Nobody thought, oh, this huge turnover is, is a problem. Like, maybe it means we're not hiring well. They were actually proud of this. They didn't feel bad about it. And they had this thing, we're a team, not a family. You know, it's like being on the Yankees, and hey, maybe you're not cut, you know, you're not able to play in the big league. So, you know, just be ready for this. This was in the culture code, but buried way in. Like, by the way, we can fire you, we probably will, right? But we'll call it graduation, so don't feel too bad, right? 
The only request I had when they finally terminated me was like, don't call it graduation, please. You know, I'm 52. Um, but there was also something really callous about this, something really uncaring. And it, it didn't jibe with the, the rhetoric on the top of creating a company we love, and this is such a fun place, and we have beer and dogs and beanbag chairs, and it's Nerf gun wars, you know. It's so much fun, but like, when it came down to it, it was way more callous than any of the old media places that I had ever worked at. Um, and it turns out this wasn't unique to them. They got this idea from Netflix, which came out with this, their own culture deck in 2009, right? And I'm old enough to remember when I first started covering tech, one of the things I was impressed about going to tech companies was, even if they didn't mean it, they would say, you know, our best assets walk out the door at night. People is really what we're about. We really need to take care of our employees because we're in the intellectual property business, right? It's your brains. That's what we are, right? Um, and this had changed, and not just at HubSpot and Netflix, but kind of across the industry. Reid Hoffman at LinkedIn has this idea that a job isn't a job anymore, it's a tour of duty, right? It's a, um, it's a transaction. You're going to be here for 18 months, two years. You, you have companies that will brag about how well they fire. I've seen people on Twitter talking about how good we are at firing people, and it's like, to me, it's like, it's like you know, proposing marriage to a woman and saying, and by the way, when we get divorced, I just want you to know I'm really good at it. Like, I'm really good at divorce. It's going to be a great divorce, right? So, um, but this is this new compact that had been formed. And, and, and honestly, I wasn't aware of it. Even though I was covering tech, I wasn't aware of what life was like on the ground for people inside some of these companies. So my book came out, and this guy from Stanford, Jeffrey Pfeffer, who's a, a big business professor, wrote this. Uh, essay called Why Modern Work Culture Makes People So Miserable. And I start to realize like there's something in the air, like there's something weird happening in work, like what work is and how we work and how we think of work and why we work. Um, and Pfeffer is saying, you know, it's, it's bad enough being an employee at where I was where, with no job security and you can get graduated whenever. It's worse if you're in the gig economy, you never even get that. You never even get to be an employee with no job security and lousy benefits. You get none of that, right? And the weirder thing is, as I've started reading more about it, the gig economy is coming for all of us, right? The notion of an employee is going to be an antiquated notion in 10, 20, 30, in my kid's lifetime. Um, white collar workers are all being forced out into this situation where we're free agents, which is okay. That's sold as like, hey, free agent nation, you're the brand of you. Isn't that cool? Well, no, because now the brand of you has to go compete for piecework in an open marketplace where you're forced to compete against everybody else who's looking for work, and it's going to grind wages down, right? That's the inevitable outcome. Now, depending on which side of that transaction you're on, it's a great thing or a bad thing. For companies, it's pitches like we're wringing all the inefficiency out of the system. For us, it means like we're going to, you know, you're going to get paid even less. Right? Um, Pfeffer says basically what we're doing is this isn't an internet enabled innovation, which is how it's sold. Right? It's sold as like, hey, this is great. We can wring all that inefficiency out and everybody can find fulfillment. No, what we're doing is returning to what we had 140 years ago. A century's worth of progress in worker rights have, have been rolled back. I did a piece in the Times a couple weekends ago about how a century ago, Workers were going on strike for better working conditions. You know, they were forming unions and going on strike in textile mills to get better hours, better protections. Now, we've flipped it up to it's so inside out that in Silicon Valley, you have people wearing t-shirts to say nine to five is for the week, you know, celebrating their workaholism, celebrating their own exploitation, right? Um, it's so pervasive that economists have created a, a name for a new class of people, the precariat. Basically, people who have precarious uh, employment who have no benefits, who don't know where, how they're going to pay the bills next month, next year, right? And this is happening at a time when more wealth is being created than ever before. And it's happening in the industry where most of that wealth is being created. I'll give you three examples of the precariat. Last year in Scotland, a reporter found that workers at an Amazon warehouse factory in, in Scotland were living in a tent city outside the factory because Amazon provided a bus but charged 10 pounds a day to ride the bus, and they only paid 7 pounds an hour. So for some people, it was just worth it to live in a tent, right? Now, Jeff Bezos is worth $82 billion, right? Six months ago when I gave this talk, he was worth $70 billion. He's made $12 billion in six months, and his workers are living in tents. Um, this is Victor and Nicole. They both work in a cafeteria at Facebook, 
right? They live with their three children in a garage in Menlo Park, right? Because they can't, and they can't afford the health insurance that they could buy through their employer if they wanted it. They, they don't make enough, right? Facebook made $10 billion in profit last year. They have $30 billion in cash. Mark Zuckerberg is worth $56 billion. He's the fifth richest person on the planet. People working in the cafeteria at Facebook should be happy, right? I mean, that should be a great job. You should be like, I died and went to heaven. I got a job in the cafeteria at Facebook. I'm set for life. I'm not gonna be a bazillionaire, but I should be able to buy a house, put my kids through college, right? There's no reason for this. This is Renksdorf Park in Mountain View. I went there in June. There's 40 or 50 campers permanently set along the side of this road, right? These are working people who basically got priced out of their apartments. They took the last bit of money they had and they bought a camper and they parked it on the street and they put a generator out there and they live there. These are working people, right? The town wants them to be swept out but they, they can't get rid of them, right? This is two miles from the Googleplex, eight miles from Facebook. So this is a weird thing. The rising tide is rising, but it's not lifting all boats. Something weird is happening. You know, we're at work playing beer pong, right? But we're not noticing what's being taken away. These things that we took for granted about our jobs, at least people my age, sorry, who entered the workforce, you know, in the 20th century, security, stability, dignity, benefits, those things are being taken away. And I almost suspect that the fun and games and the dogs and the beer pong is a magician's trick, that it's a form of misdirection. It's like, we're all having fun, work is fun, and like, just don't look at what's coming out of your pocket on the other side, right? So then the question is why? And I apologize, I think this slide is hard to read, but if you look at venture capital and you look at where it was in 1995 and where it was in 2015, so 95, the beginning of the boom to a couple years ago, right? It's four times as many, or twice as many firms and funds, four times as many active investors, seven times as much money invested, right? 95 is when this all began. I think Netscape went public in, what was it, 90, in around there. And what these guys have created is a new business model, right, which is grow fast, lose money, go public, cash out, right? That's the model. It started with Netscape. Netscape was the first company that could go public while losing money. Until, this, until then, the public markets wouldn't pay for a company that wasn't both growing really quickly and posting a profit, but Netscape pulled it off. And you wonder, how widespread is this? I'll show you in a second, but the other thing to remember is every bad thing springs from this. This business model, grow fast, lose money, go public, cash out. Every bad thing comes from this. I did a roll up a few months ago of all the tech IPOs since 2011. Then I subtracted anything that had been acquired. So just the ones that are left independent, I got 60 companies, only 10 had ever made a profit, right? So if you wonder, suddenly it hit me, if you wanna know why is the workplace changing, this is it, right? If you don't make a profit, if you don't make any money, you can't take care of your employees. More to the point, if you don't ever intend to make a profit, if you know from the beginning that this company will never make a profit, you even have even less concern for employees. So consider companies like Zynga and Groupon that went public in 2011 at the beginning of this latest rush. As soon as the, everybody made their money and the VCs cashed out and the founders cashed out, those companies collapsed. They never made money. These aren't really companies. These are vehicles, these are financial instruments. These are little wagons that these guys build. They roll them into the public markets, fill them up with money, roll them back, put them in their pocket, and get the hell out before the whole thing falls apart. Not in every case, not in every case, but a lot. The other ill effects that come from this, quickly I wanna go through, bro culture, income inequality, and what I call even worse stuff. I couldn't come up with a, a better name. Um, bro culture has become rampant, and we're all aware of it. It's another thing I've written about in the Times recently, right? VCs are bros, they invest in bros, the bros hire bros, and they build a frat house because somewhere along the line, John Doerr or Kleiner Perkins or some other venture capitalist, I guess, was walking around Stanford on a Friday night looking at some drunk dorm and go, this is a great model for how to build a company. Why don't we just give these guys millions of dollars? Like, that makes sense, right? A frat house, of course, right? You know, yeah. Um, 
and you have this idea of culture fit, right? They hire for culture fit, which just basically is a euphemism for we hire other white guys like us, right? And the best example of this to me is Uber. And the problem with it isn't just that it excludes people, is that, that these guys don't really know how to run companies. Frat boys are not the best business people in the world, believe it or not, right? I love the picture of Travis on the cover of Fortune. I think this, by the way, came out the same week he was fired. But anyway, I don't think I'm an asshole. It's like the rest of us would like to respectfully disagree, Trav, you know? I think maybe just think about that for a little, a little second more, you know? Um, bro culture brings with it bias on every vector, right? On age, you turn 40 and you're out, or you don't even get in, right? Race, no, forget it. When I was at HubSpot, the first time we had an all-hands meeting and I saw all 500 people in one big room, I realized there's no black people. And not only that, there was only one kind of white people. They, all, they looked like they all came from Cape Cod, right? It was like they made them in a lab, right? If you ever want to get really amused or incredibly sad, do a thing where you roll up the management pages of all the unicorns, all the American unicorns, and roll up their boards of directors, like, and do like, you know, little thumbnail sketches, and it's just like white guys made in some lab at Stanford. I don't know where they come from, right? They all look the same, right? And gender, I mean, gender, God, that's the, you know, the biggest victim of the bro culture thing is women get in, but they only go this high up in the organization. They don't become promoted. And even here, they just get harassed to death. I mean, that's what the amazing thing to me about Uber is the Uber story unraveled with one woman who was brave enough to just stand up and say what happened to her, right? To me, she's an enormous hero because it was, took a lot of courage to do that. Um, oh, thank you. And, I, and her name is Susan Fowler. I hope someday they have like a statue or an award named after her. She went to the Supreme Court and, and uh, testified there. I, I've written to her and um, corresponded a bit with her. I, 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 I admire her courage. I can't say how much. Um, so the next one is income inequality. Right now there are eight guys whose combined wealth equals the, the combined wealth of the bottom half of the world. A few years ago, this was a few hundred people. Then it came to 30. Now it's eight. Four of them are techies, five if you count Bloomberg, right? Although I think Bloomberg fell off more recently. But anyway, you get the idea. The industry is creating this radical concentration of wealth into fewer and fewer hands, right? And this started a while ago, but it spiked in the internet era. This is the, the ratio of what an average CEO makes to the average worker. For a long time, it was in the 20s. Then look at spike in 2000, at the height of the dot-com bubble. Kind of falls back, and you think, well, maybe we're going back to 20. It's like, no, no, we're back at 300. And we're gonna, we, we like it here. We're just going to stay. We'll stay with the 300 ratio. Thank you, right? Um, 40 years ago, wages represented 52% of the US GDP. Today, they represent 46%. So where did that 6% go? Corporate profits went from 6% to 12%. 6% of GDP shifted from our pockets into corporate profits, which they're not reinvesting, they're keeping as profits in order to line their own pockets by making the stock go up and then getting bigger bonuses, right? That 6% is worth $1 trillion. A $1 trillion has been stolen from us. So I talked about even worse stuff, and this is the first example, right? The precariat kind of realizes something bad has happened. I, I think I used to have a trillion dollars, and I don't know what happened to it, or is it, right? But they don't really know what or how, and they lash out with Brexit, with Trumpism. You know, they know they're being screwed, but they feel powerless, and the, they say, you know, I still have one thing that Larry Ellison has, the same, that's the same as Larry Ellison, I have a vote, and I'm gonna use it, and I'm gonna punish you, right? Now, that's just the first step. It gets worse, right? If we keep going this way, there are people like this guy, Nick Hanauer, who's fortunate enough to be one of the early, maybe the first investor in Amazon. He's amazingly rich. He's the guy who ginned up that trillion dollar number. I mean, he didn't gin it up, it's a real number, but uh, who pointed it out. He thinks we're facing a revolution, right? That this is just the, the, the first inklings of what's gonna become, you know, the pitchforks are coming for us. And his solution is very simple. That trillion dollars that got stolen, just let's give it back. Like, like, like we can take the money, we just fix the problem we created. Um, the response from Silicon Valley has been quite different, right? It's just run away, right? So it's like they're willfully blind to the problem they've caused, right? And if, Oddly enough, look at all of the interesting highfalutin rhetoric that comes out of Silicon Valley, the most interesting stuff that they all sit around navel-gazing about. It's all about escape, 
right? Silicon Valley is all about escape right now. So they're going to do seasteading. Well, you know, we won't fix this world. It's all fucked up anyway. We'll just build an island where we're in charge and we'll live there, right? Or we'll carve California up into six states and one will be Silicon Valley so we won't have to support all those assholes in the other parts of California, right? Or we'll have some sort of tech utopia, either part of a city, or we'll create these worlds that are outside government control and we'll just let, like, Google control it, sorry upon it, but you know, we'll let big tech companies rule that, that or, or let Peter Thiel run it, that'll be good, right? Or you have Ray Kurzweil talking about the singularity, which is a basically, let's escape biology, right? Well, let's escape death itself. We don't even have to die. We can just, we can become immortal, right? Elon Musk says, no, fuck that, let's go to Mars, right? We'll just live on Mars, right? <laughs> That's what we'll do, right? And then, then they have a big debate. Can we get to Mars? I don't know. Can we do it in our lifetime? Will the singularity happen? It's like, meanwhile, they're stepping over homeless people on the way to work. They have to drive past Rengsdorf Park and the campers to go have this stupid conversation, right? That only really stupid rich people could even have. They have the luxury of having these conversations, right? The best version of escapism, and it's a near-term one. This is a story from The New Yorker a few months ago, which you definitely should read. Doomsday prep for the super rich. Oligarchs are buying land, right, stocking up on guns and food and ammunition, right, to prepare for the apocalypse that they think is coming, right, um, that they caused. Peter Thiel has bought, built a big compound in New Zealand with a landing strip, you know, and an armored bunker so that if the shit really hits the fan, right, he can fly to New Zealand and just hide in a hole with his billions of dollars, right? Instead of fixing the problem, like Nick Hanauer says, just take the money, give it back, fix the problem, right? They're just going to go hide out with their money. Thiel, who, by the way, campaigned for Trump, and then suddenly you don't hear about him. He just vanished right, when Trump won. Um, so they don't want to take responsibility for the problem they created, which is a long way of getting to the point that fucking Stallman was right the whole time, right? Like, this is what I finally realized 20 years later. It's like, I thought he was crazy because he's living on a cot in MIT, right? But um, he wasn't. Um, we, you know, we, we um, on the HBO show Silicon Valley, we, we had a big running joke about how these smarmy marketing tech people come out and talk about changing the world and making the world a better place. You know, Gavin Belson, who's just a complete villain, right? Um, but the thing I want to leave you with is I still believe that we can make the world a better place, right? I think it's first by abandoning that model of grow fast, lose money, cash out and run away, right? Um, we can easily, easily create companies where Amazon workers don't have to live in tents and where Uber drivers can be real employees with real benefits and some dignity and a decent life, right? And where cafeteria workers at Facebook can actually have a good life. They shouldn't have to live in a garage, right? We can do that, right? Um, the reason I first fell in love with covering technology a long time ago, historically speaking, was that it was an industry that had lifted up thousands of people, had created prosperity for entire communities, right? That industry has been hijacked by people who just want to get rich quick and to hell with everybody else. But you guys, the people who build things, who build companies, you're the ones who can fix it. Um, thank you very much.